All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the American Library in Paris's Evenings with an Author series. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the American Library. So for those of you who don't know much about us, perhaps you're joining us from the States and haven't yet visited us, we hope you're able to one day. Um, I wanted to start by saying a few words about the library. Um, we are an independent nonprofit institution, which means we're not receiving any government funding from either the US or France. Um, we rely on the generosity of donors and also from our members and have a very supportive community that we feel very, very grateful for. We're also the largest English language lending library on the continent, and that's something we're incredibly proud of. We have a tremendous uh, amount of resources, both uh, in terms of sort of books, but also periodicals, digital resources, everything you could want. Um, we also host programs. Generally, they happen in our, our space, our beautiful space, but because of the pandemic, we've been moving to virtual programming and we're sort of sticking with that format to keep everybody safe for the time being. Um, I should also mention that we're 100 years old this year. So we've been celebrating our centennial all the way through um, confinement and coming out of confinement and finding sort of innovative ways to celebrate our legacy and let everybody know about our impressive history. Um, so one thing to highlight there is that we're gonna be holding something called the Century Gala, which is our annual gala, and that will take place on October 8th. And if you'd like to visit our website to learn more about that, I invite you to do so. We still do have um, digital tickets available. Um, so please have a look at that if that's something that sounds like it's of interest. Um, you can also learn about us generally by visiting our Facebook page, our Instagram page, our homepage, anywhere you might have found out about this event would be a great place to find out about future events as well. All right, so I'm delighted this evening to be joined by Dr. Cla Clara Oropesa. She is a Latina writer and professor of English literature at Santa Barbara City College in California. Her book, Anias Nin, A Myth of Her Own, was published in 2019. Clara's research combines comparative mythology, feminist and literary studies, and cultural theory. She has contributed various essays to Sage Woman and Between. Clara earned a PhD in comparative mythology and literature from Pacifica Graduate Institute and an MA in English literature from California State University, Los Angeles. Her new book will be a collection of essays about coming of age alongside literary and biological form mothers whose voices tell us about essential material and spiritual conditions for women to flourish. It looks at the relationship between vulnerability and creativity of modernist writers, namely Anias Nin, Virginia Woolf, Gabriela Mistral, and Victoria Ocampo. So tonight, Clara is joining us to speak about Anias Nin in particular. Um, so Clara, I think we'll begin by perhaps inviting you to do a short reading from your preface, and then we'll, we'll have a conversation about the book. Great, thank you. Um, so this, is, this comes from my preface called Tracing the Faces of Life, Creativity, and Literature. That's as loud as I can get it. So my exploration of Anais Nin's myth of poesies hopes to claim a space for the creative depth of a writer who ardently sought to give voice to the plurality of truth as integral parts of her sense of self. Nin sought to fuse language with embodied experiences, including her personal visions of art, which she detailed in her diaries for over 60 years. She kept a record of how language, intuition, and the imagination both animates and informs the magnified, multifarious, and deepened experience of the writer. It was her contention that narratives must be experienced through a triad pathway, enmeshing the intellect, embodiment, and imagination. This means that Nin's particular creed about the relationship between life and art is to be regarded under two distinct human needs. One is the human need to be intimate with experience, and, this, and then there's a second need in human nature, which is to create something that has more permanence, which is the myth of our lives, the spiritual significance of our lives. Breaking conventions of her era by choosing to reject monogamy and live a child-free life Nin was an anomaly. In addition, she defended the right for women to have the freedom of as many relationships as men had been privileged to engage in for centuries. Refusing to act under the sexist culture and literary influences of her time, Nin broke from gender constructs by writing about topics that were previously forbidden to women. 
Some themes in her work include homoeroticism and the exploration of women's sexuality. Also, metaphors of incest factor heavily in her early writing. As a diarist, engaging a literary genre that blurs the boundaries between truth and fiction, private and public, Nin st strove to contend with the heart-head schism of literature. She also wrote fiction that is often difficult to categorize and is frequently misread as merely self-inflating her own life. More accurately, in her fiction, Nin cobbles together a mythic method including experimentation with language, mythic tropes, mythic tropes from a hermeneutics of her own. The mythic tropes in her work testify to tensions that often combine experimental sensuality and physicality on one hand, and a deep desire to transform, create, and transcend on another. Moreover, study Nin's, liter liter study Nin's work reminds us that the relationship between the author's life, cultural milieu, and work is never straightforward, nor should it be. But by knowing the light, that life does not explain the work, nor does the work explain the life, readers should remain curious and cautious when looking at the mirrored ways in which life and art intersect. Thank you. That was a wonderful passage to read, Claire. I think that gives us a really nice overview of, of the issues that your book explores. Um, I should say also that I, I absolutely loved the book, so I didn't say that in the beginning, but of course I should start by saying it was a real pleasure to read this work. And for someone who didn't know much about Nin and who wasn't exposed much to her work beforehand, I, I have to say I'm really, really curious to learn much more. So I will um, I will admit off the back that I'm not a Nin specialist, but That's I hope okay. that can That's why I'm here. <laughs> exactly. You're here to help us through this and we can have a sort of illuminating conversation about yeah. this empowering literary figure. Um, well, thank so you for that. that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. You know, it's been a dream of mine to bring Nin back to Paris. She was born in Paris. She was, um, and Paris remained her adored city throughout her life. So it's, it's really, I'm elated to be here. Fantastic. Um, so I think I'll start by asking sort of just about the, the origins of the book and sort of your angle into exploring Nin. Um, I wanted to, to ask you to elaborate for us on the connection between Nin and myth in the book. I mean, this, this is obviously right in the title, right? She's a myth of her own. So maybe just tell us about that. So I've always been interested in Nin's literary opus as a diarist, a novelist, and an essayist, and as really representative of a body of work that captures what it means to gain a voice in one's life, what it means to fight against patriarchal structures and conditioning, machismo, misogyny, to basically individuate as women. And Nin believed that we could write ourselves out of the roles that society imposes on us by telling stories about ourselves and others. And so in my book, I start by exploring a pivotal tension in Nin's life as she's emerging as a writer within the historical, cultural, and literary context of the 1930s in Paris. And a quote that really sets the stage for this time in Nin's life, and it also sets into motion my interest for the book, is that women need According to Nin, women needed to sever themselves from the myths that men had created, and they had to resist being created by him. So she's really talking about the modernist wasteland of the time, which was the problem of the modern man that had produced World War I. And so there's all the questioning that's, that's you know, unfolding about how are we going to put the world back together? Will we draw from myth? Will we draw from religion? Um, for Nin, what was really um, important to her was drawing from psychology. And so what is the myth for the female writer, according to Nin, is what my book looks at. And I begin with a dictum that was important to Nin at the time that comes, comes from Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, whom uh, Nin was reading at the time. And the dictum is that if you explore the personal deep enough, you connect to the collective. So my book explores Nin's mythopoesis, which is really the crafting and the making of myth. And um, what I uh, set forth in the book is the idea that for Nin, making her myth was really this, a, a kind of similar process to creating and recreating her personal myth as a writer. And it's also about consciousness making. It's about making consciousness and remaking consciousness for Nin. And so in the book, um, that's largely the interest is, um, you know, how does Nin write herself this myth? And in some ways, it's 
It's a look at how Nin basically writes herself a home. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to speak, speak a little bit next about sources here. Um, so you're sort of extensively mining uh, Nin's personal you know, diaries, uh, basically her journals and her sort of more informal work, let's say. And one of the one of the things I really liked about your work is that it's it's an attempt to validate um, an exploration of the literary diary as a, a very very important form in considering a literary figure or a personality. Um, and you you go through and you have some arguments about how the this is a genre that's been you know, kind of undervalued. And so you're really shining the spotlight into that, especially because there's so much rich connection to myth um, in Nin's diaries. So maybe just tell us a little bit about what it was like to take um, these literary diaries as, as a source and why that was important to you. Um, so yeah, the genre, I think for me, looking at Nin's work, because she was such a, a prominent diarist, I mean, she kept a diary for 60 years, which ends up being an, an amazing record for us of, of the feminine, you know, psyche and, and experience. Um, and so looking at Nin's work definitely included, you know, an emphasis and a focus on the diary. Um, but my, my curiosity for her work has always been about how do we read the diaries? Um, the diary is such a complex form in the sense that people think that it's a literal kind of confession. I mean, there's that too. Um, so in the book, what I was interested in looking at, you know, the history of the genre, um, dating back to the proto, uh, proto diary in um, Japanese classical history, which is called the pillow book, where women wrote pillow books. And, and it was really the space for women to be intimate with their, with them, their thoughts. And then this, you know, the images that they took them in under their pillows. And then we have, you know, 18th century, 18th century in, um, British society, we have the etiquette diary where women were very much kind of, you know, uh, educated to keep etiquette diaries where they could gauge their own etiquette um, and also read about their etiquette. And so my interest is um, in the, also the idea is that in the canon, women are not credited with being contributing to shaping the genre. And so that's always been interesting to me that here's Nin, um, you know, being this prolific diarist, um, yet in a genre that has never really been, when you look at the, the canon, um, the canonical history of the diaries that women are very absent. So my interest was to first trace and, and um, understand the diary as a genre some more in its complexity. And so I do look at, um, for example, you know, the, the, the canon credits Pepe's um, um, as one of the major diarists, when again, we have women who have been contributing to diaries for so long. Um, but I was interested in looking at when in the kind of trajectory of genre studies, the diary is kind of given credit for being a, a, a substantial um, form of self-life writing. And that really doesn't happen until like the 60s with feminist cr uh, critics. And so my interest was uh, what would have drawn, what draws um, women to the diaries, what draws these, uh, mostly was the modernist women, what draws them to their diaries, and then ultimately what draws them into her diaries. And so um, some of the, the kind of the, the research shows that the diary is an incredibly flexible form. Um, the diary can be so many things. And I think this is leading to why Nin would have been so interested in the diary. Um, I think it's the, the idea that, you know, the diary could be a historical document, no doubt. The diary could be a confession. Um, you know, we have Fanny Burney, who in 1811 gets a, a mastectomy without anesthesia. And she writes about it in her diary in this very kind of recorded, here's what's happened. Um, that diary becomes incredibly important to us in terms of what we know about women in medicine and women in these, you know, having these experiences. Um, and then for Virginia Woolf, the diary, we know she adored it because of its spontaneity, its flexibility, its capacity to, to just do what she needs it to do at the time. And so for Nan, um, what drew her to the diary was really um, the way she puts it early in her life is that her diary was really a place where she could relive her life in terms of a dream, a myth, and an endless story. And I, I really, to me, that really captures Nin's interest in life as narrative, right? I mean, this idea that you're going to record the quotidian, the, the daily, um, and but it's not just that. And the fact that Nin was so interested in weaving dreams and myths into her diary, we know that for Nin, probing her sense of self in her diaries was not a mere conscious endeavor. It was gonna, it was gonna require unconsciousness. It was gonna require her dreams. 
Um, so I think that the flexibility, flexibility that the genre has always offered men, um, and I think if we could see the genre as having this capacity for this exploring the multi, you know, the multiplicity of self like men was so interested in, we can then better appreciate not only men as a diarist and her diaries, but just diaries in general as, as this flexible genre that really just needs to move with whatever the writer wants to bring to it. Absolutely. Um, I also wanted to move then from speaking about the genre to sort of a more person-centric uh, way of approaching this. So in your in your book, obviously, the myth of the diarist is a tremendously important idea. And it sounds like in some of your future work, you're going to continue along this exact um, theme. So I was hoping you might tell us um, a little bit about that and how Nin um, and her mythology is shaped by her herself being a diarist. Well, I think one of the ways to think about it is, um, I mean, it's a very complex, I think there are a lot of kind of angles to, in which to think about it. Um, but what I do in the book is I look at the myth of the trick star. Um, and I argue that um, the trick stars really gets constellated in a society where there is a lot of upheaval, okay? It's the mundus and veg, it's, it's the world turned upside down. So, um, what happens when you know when we're going to try to write about ourselves construct a sense of ourselves in the world in a very kind of topsy-turvy world which is very much the case of when nin started her diaries in 1914 it's the onset of world war one um her family her father has just abandoned the family and so nin takes to her diary initially with this very kind of mundus and verses as a way to recompile a sense of herself and and her environment and knowing that it's going to really require her imagination to rebuild that world um so I think um, I think that idea that for the myth of for the myth of the diarist, um, and I want to be clear that I'm not suggesting that Nin is the, the trick star, but I think the form, the genre has a lot of capacity for um, this. Again, like it's really trickery. It's the idea of of things needing to be told from a slant, things needing to be told not necessarily directly. directly. Um, sometimes truth is too blinding. Um, so I think by bringing a, kind of a mythological lens or an archetypal experience such as the trickster, I think it helps us to better understand to some extent um, what Nin was after in those early diaries, basically. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to talk next a little bit about your research process. So. I know that um, you were working extensively on the posthumously published diaries of Nin from the 1930s. Um, these, these are surrounded by sort of a great deal of scandal. And I wondered if yeah. you might tell us a little bit more about that and about your own process yeah. um, going through these documents and how that shaped the book. Yeah, so, so yes, there is a scandal that ensues and really kind of hovers over Nin's literary opus. Um, that for me really uh, it stems from 1995 when her posthumous works were published um the diaries that she wrote in the 30s so we're fast forwarding 60 years later and her works are published and they're compiled in an um edited version that's called incest from a journal of love um and to me that title already i mean the the, the editors of that collection are breaking from nin's nomenclature because nin herself titled her diaries by volume it was volumes one through seven so um I have, throughout, you know, the decades in my life that I've been interested in his work, I knew that writing a book on Nin, um, I would have to contend with that, um, figuring out what, 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 um, what is another way that we can understand, so to speak, the, the scandal, right? And so my interest was in looking in the archives, and I had a hypothesis that there was something that, that needed to kind of be looked at deeper. I wasn't sure exactly what it was, and it was an interesting experience I, I, being in the archives because that is where um, you know I, I would go uh, mine and see what what I could find. Um, but it was a really complex and interesting experience because I always felt like I was indeed in the presence of the trick star while I was in the archives because every time I thought I had a little thread to kind of um, run with, um, more things would surface and more things would surface. And so my process for that chapter um, is really involves a lot of work in the archives, um, trying to, first of all, 
decipher my way through the archives because there's a lot of material. Min has 25 boxes that are UCLA's um, special collections. Um, but ultimately, I did come up with some with a better understanding. And what that chapter does is it hopes to show um, it hopes that I hope that readers will take pause when um, you know reading that chapter rather than thinking of Maine as this, as as the, within the the kind of the shadow of the controversy. And I should back up and say the reason why it ensued in controversy is because it um, it narrates an incest relationship between Min and her father. So that's so that created scandal among her readers. Um, and then there's largely been this, you know, kind of moral judgment over hovering over men's work since. Um, and I do want to just add one more thing before going on. Um, the chapter is really the premise of that chapter where I look at men's archives and, and, and try to decipher what, what went on in the editing process. Um, the, the real premise for that chapter is that I really believe that a literary text should exist on its own, like a cultural artifact, like it's not grounded entirely in the, in the time that produced it. But I do feel that when when scandal like that ensues, like it did around Nin's text from the 30s, I think that we need to go back into context. That text is no longer given that freedom to just exist. So what I do in the chapter is I, I do that. I, I take the text that she was writing in the 30s and I try to contextualize them in, in the, um, again in the 30s. What was Nin reading? She's reading the Surrealist. She's reading the um, emerging psychological theories. And I try to really just give some context to what was happening in her life at that time. So it was a big, deep, entailed process, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely tell. Um, <laughs> so to turn next to um, maybe some of the work that Nin did beyond her diaries, I wanted to ask you to talk to us about uh, Nin's feminist rewriting of myths. Um, I found this section to be one of the very richest in the book. I mean, you and I have already connected before everyone else joined us in the Zoom room to talk about the myth of the Minotaur and how she has, she rewrote that myth and its historical implications. She sort of shifted them around, but feel free to use any other examples that you might uh, want to tell our audience about and speak about this a bit. Yeah. Yeah, so what I do in that chapter is I, I am interested in how Nin, Nin rewrote myth from a feminine perspective, and, and that is a prominent one where um, she has a novel called Seduction of the Minotaur, and it is a, a kind of, you know, reading of the Minotaur myth, the classical Minotaur myth, which involves slaying and a male protagonist. Um, but in the novel, Nin is so interested in, in, in really what her characters can do more so with in the sense of integrating. How do her characters integrate? um you know they're they're kind of you know shadows and demons and so um that was that was you know important to her at the time in terms of figuring out how do women then navigate those kinds of um you know patriarchal structures and 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 from the perspective of the female uh protagonist and really what nin does in that book is it's um i would say it's more of ariadne um the rewriting it from ariadne's perspective here she is the weaver of life, she's gonna weave herself a way out rather than severing, right? She's gonna weave some kind of way of integrating all of the things that are largely, you know, uh, preoccupying her. Um, but Nin is interested in, in the myths that she can then reveal that, that the qualities and myths for integration, basically, of all parts of her. Okay, hey, thank you for that. Um, yeah. Let's let's turn to sort of the huge topic of feminism. I mean, you you throw that word into the mix, and you can go a thousand different directions, sort of like Ariadne in the maze. But um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe you wanted to tell us a little about a little bit about um, the implication for Nin's brand of feminism or version of feminism or multiplicity of them, feminisms, uh, in the 21st century. I mean, I can imagine that we could talk about ecofeminism, the relationship between humans mm -hmm. and non-human animals, um, wherever you'd like to go with that. How, how do you think she's doing today? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's a good question. How would she be cheering us on, right? Um, I think Nan's feminism really reminds us of how much continuity there is between one historical era and the other. Um, I think, in other words, um, the, the you know the wasteland that prevailed during Nan's time, this disconnection from nature, these these you know oppressive patriarchal structures, they're very much alive in our world today. Um, and I think 
um, also at the center are, you know, amazing things trying to happen and be birthed, um, yet within environments that aren't really welcoming to them. Um, so for me, I think Nin's poetic voice really represents um, what it means largely for one to find a place in society, find our own place in society. And I think um, I would go back to Nin's credo in terms of today. And Nin's credo is the notion that two things are important to our sense of, you know, our sense of humanness, according to Nin, that I think really speaks to us today. And one of them is that we have to be intimate with our experiences. Um, the second one is about creating the myths of our lives, creating the spiritual significance, importance of our lives. And what are those things that are important to us? How do we create meaningful things that connect us to others and including non-human nature? And so when I think of Nin in the 21st century, I really think of that credo because I hear some of our three major crises, so to speak, um, echoed in that. I think the pandemic, right? The idea that we're all, you know, most of us are home right now, uh, contending with what it means to, to kind of, you know, take pause, so to speak, from the outside world and having these opportunities. A lot of us are realizing that some of the patriarchal structures that, that we're taking a break from were really harmful and toxic. So how do we rebuild? Um, and how do we have these intimate conversations, right? Um, the second big deal, I think, too, is, is when we talk about race relations. Um, how are we going to prevail against you know, the injustices, the racial injustices? Um, I was listening to this beautiful interview with um, Claudia Rankins. Um, she's um, talking about her new book. And she called for a critical, a critical self-reflection, this, this need that we have to ask ourselves these questions right now about these, you know, white supremacist structures that we belong to and how do we approach, how do we approach change without having this real capacity to self-reflect. So I hear again Nin's echo in there. And then lastly, um, the environment. I live in California where we're suffering tremendous fires, right? And this idea of we experience writing according to men. Writing, it, language is rooted in the body, right? It's, it's, we experience it through metaphors, through myths. And the, uh, the idea that these poetic that we, you know, use to transform um, are part of an ecosystem. And so I, I hear Nin's echoing a reminder to all of us that we are parts of ecosystems, not separated. And how do we, how do we then engage? So, I really think that Nin, again, offers us a philosophical justification, if we're looking for one, okay, about why the, the, the building of an interior world is so important to address calamities in society, right? Nin would argue that it's not just to resist alienation from ourselves, but it's really about bridging our sense of ourselves, bridging our sense of community with each other, including non-human nature. So I do think Nin's work has a strong echo critical call for us that we need to heed today. Absolutely. Thank you for that very generous response to contextualize it a bit more personally for us as well. Um, and continuing kind of on a similar note then, you know, I wanted to ask, given that you had this completely immersive experience of researching Nin and, and all of her versions, sort of the selves that she presented in her diaries, as well as the um, the accounts, uh, or the tales, her novels, basically, which are sometimes based in some personal experiences that she, that she had lived. Um, I wanted to ask, to what extent do you feel that you had a really extensive understanding of this figure in her work? Um, do you feel that you were able to make some sort of sense of Nin, or are there sort of gaps where you're still thinking, well, she remains a mystery to me kind of in these mm -hmm. several ways, you know? Yeah. I think it's a little bit of both. I do. I mean, it's been such an honor. It's been like one of the biggest, you know, one of the honors of my adult life is, is getting to know Nin in, in the terms of the archives and, and kind of, you know, put together this, this person in, in some way in her work. Um, I feel like I was able to get my, my you know, get a sense of, of what was important and meaningful to Nin especially around the time that, that, I, that my book and my research really focuses, which is the 20s and 30s of um, Nin's life, um, the kind of the Paris years, which is what I've been interested in. Um, however, of course, I think Nin is incredibly complex. There are so many facets to her. There are so many things that, that you know, 
interest her and, and drove her and, and excited her and 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 I'm I'm happy with the fact that I don't think I got it entire I don't think I got her entirely. There's so much still, um, and I'm okay with that. And I do want her to live, you know, and this I, I want to give her the freedom to to continue to surprise me and, and be an enigma. Um, but as far as the idea of her her fight for a voice and and to develop her mode as a writer. I feel like I got a sense of that. And, and that has been, you know, I think it's a big source of inspiration for me, obviously. Um, you know, she's part of the, the next work I'm writing. Um, but I think Ben was incredibly complex, there's no doubt. Exactly. And, you know, I imagine that with, uh, with any figure who's, who's become so important as Nin, there must be sort of a little, a subculture of people producing Nin scholarship and people who sort of try to know everything they can or master her right. canon or her personality or her psychology right. and her ideas. Totally. Do you view yourself as kind of in this camp or kind of working against some of the mainstream ideas about in Nin scholarship or how would you place yourself in your research um, as compared to other people who have done work on Nin? Yeah, I think it's, I, I place myself in Nin literary scholarship. Um, I place, I align myself with the scholars of Nin and the, the, the women and the, the writers that have been interested in Nin's work in terms of closely reading Nin's work. That's my interest in, in closely reading Nin's work. Um, what she, you know, what she edited herself. I'm interested in, in her editing process and what she wrote. Um, there is a branch of, of interest in Nin's work for sure. It's a little more of the celebrity studies in terms of what, um, you know, Nin, who Nin was in terms of her preoccupation with being, you know, in the limelight, um, especially towards the latter part of her life. Um, I'm not really interested in that. Um, and I think um, my, my work really leans toward um, genre studies, feminist studies, and then also most recently just with revisioning a little bit of what modernism is in terms of, um, you know, literary modernism and what were the literary modes contributing to modernism that we have not, um, you know, that haven't been canonicized. Um, so I see my work really fitting more into that kind of um, area of NIN studies. And mostly I hope for new, um, new generation NIN readers really is that they can, you know, have this more perspective in, in um, maybe some of the context that I cover in the book. Fantastic. You're sort of leading me right into my next question. I so appreciate that. Um, I did want to ask for, you know, for the uninitiated among us, for those of us who are just beginning our journey, getting to know Nin, if you might have any recommendations of places to start certain works of hers, um, maybe not the 1930s diaries. I'm not sure if you would recommend that be what we <laughs> get into, right? from the, but I'll, I'll kind of let you take that wherever you'd like. Right. So in order to grow this readership, where would you recommend that we begin? Well, I think definitely even the 30s. I mean, just not the not the posthumous work. I wouldn't go to the posthumous works first. You know what I mean? Remember, posthumous is really the stuff that was published that she didn't edit. Um, Nin had a, a very rigorous editing process of her diaries, and, and she never um, she she spoke about her editing process um, quite frequently in the latter parts of her life. But I I think her diaries, you know, the volumes one through seven, which are the ones that she edited and published that were published while she was alive. I think any of those diaries really, um, you know, would be a, a wonderful place to start and dive into her poetics. Again, just the poetics, which is something I'm always drawn to in her work. Um, I don't think the diaries even have to be read linearly. Um, I think for, for a beginning, you know, a new Nin reader, any volume would work. And maybe picking a decade that's interesting to, to one, right? Um, I also think her fiction for me is always such a treat. Um, she has a collection called the Cities of In, uh, the Cities of Interior, which is a collection of five novelettes. Um, any of those novelettes, again, then you know, like I think like most writers, right? When they write works that are, um, you know, works that subsequent works, you don't always have to read them in any kind of order. Um, but I would recommend her novelettes, anything in the Cities of Interior, really. Um, and then again, her, her, for the richness of what she captures in her diaries, I think are, are still illuminating to us today profoundly. Yeah. 
Great, thank you for those recommendations. So I do see we've got some questions already coming in. So everybody's really eager to jump into the the question and uh, question and answer time here. So okay. I will invite um, our attendees to please submit any questions that you have in the chat box, and I'll go ahead and select um, you know as many of those as we can get to to read out loud for Clara. Um, but before we transition to that, I I wanted to ask two final questions. They're both very small. Um, so the first one is how can we get a hold of your book if we'd like to order? And the yes. second one is what are you currently reading? Maybe this is about you know, as you write your next project, or just more generally, what have you been reading in this pandemic time? <laughs> so my book, mostly it's available with the publisher, which is Rotledge, and I'll just hold my book up. Um, it is on Amazon, but I don't think Amazon has the paperback, and the paperback just came out um, early this year. So the paperback, um, I would really, um, I think the, the best place to go for the paperback is the publisher, um, which again is Rutledge. And um, the second question was, what am I reading, right? Yes, exactly. So, okay, I have two things. Um, one is um, to kind of, been, it's been appeasing my longing that I can't be in Paris this summer um, or fall. Um, I've been reading um, Lindsay Tremuda's The New Parisian. Can you see The New Parisian? Um, the Women and Ideas Shaping Paris. And this is amazing because like, we hosted her. Out. I, I have to oh, interrupt you, you and say, you just hosted her. Yeah, so I'm not sure That's if this so was a... Funny. A plug, but no, we are no, reading it's not. in our community. Right? It's such a it's such a sweet book. Um, what she basically does, right, is she profiles fifty amazing women doing amazing things in Paris right now. And what I really appreciate is just the collection is comprised of this diversity of women, right? Diverse backgrounds, um, and doing different amazing things in Paris. We have activists, we have teachers, um, we have the tastemakers, right? Just people doing different things. And um, it, there's a sweet section at the end, right, where um, she asks every woman, every woman, what is her favorite female-owned business in Paris, and then they get to tell what that is. And it's been a sweet way for um, me to collect another list of things to do next time I'm in Paris. And then there's the photographs, of course. There's some very beautiful photographs, right, of, of the city and just the different neighborhoods, and that's been really kind of warming my heart lately. Um, and then the next one, I don't know if you've hosted her, right? Um, Valeria Luiselli's, um, the children's, uh, the children's Lost Children Archives, um, which is amazing, amazing. I love um, Luiselli's prose, it's so beautiful. Um, it's a really a road trip novel, right? The, the parents leaving New York, driving to the Southwest. And um, we get to have so many insights from the mother's perspective in terms of the landscape of the family. Um, all within the backdrop of a very inhumane immigration system, which we all know um, is, is incredibly um, prevalent in our world today. So that is what's been keeping me kind of grounded lately. Fantastic. That's so funny that we, yeah, I mean, we would we'd love to have both authors back. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. I think I'm we're sure. on the same, same wavelength here. Um, right, I love so, that. I'll go ahead and transition to the audience questions then since we do okay. have a, quite a few coming in. We may not be able to make it to everybody. I apologize in advance if we don't get to yours. Um, so the first one is from Deborah, who's wondering, uh, do you think Nin's myth-making follows Joseph Campbell's hero's path or perhaps a feminine variation of it? That's such a good question. I'm sure Nin was definitely reading Campbell. Um, I am sure there are some parallels. Yeah, there's there's no doubt um, in terms of the, the feminine um, version. Um, so yeah, my short answer would be yes. I'm sure there are some parallels in terms of right the, the calling, um, right, and how to proceed with the calling and and, and the challenges, um, and then needing to make it full circle. Yeah, I, I think I think there would definitely be some parallels. Thank you for that. Great. So the next question is from Shala, who's wondering, um, well, she's telling us, so for Virginia Woolf, keeping her diary was a way of practicing her art. To what extent did Nin try out her art in her diary? That's such an excellent question. And thank you for asking that, because I think that is really pivotal to the role of the diaries for modernist writers, for sure, for Woolf and Nin. Um, it was a space. Um, Sometimes we call it that that the diary was a very subjective playground. This is where women can go and literally play and, and try out their ideas and contend with what 
right? What issues were, were um, surfacing for them. Um, and in one of my chapters, I do something similar where um, in chapter volume five of Min's Diaries is when she's writing Seduction of the Minotaur. And that was one of my, one of my, one of the many favorite things to do was to look at what was going on in Min, with Min and her diaries when she was writing parallel to the novels that she was writing. And so in chapter five, I look at um, what it is that Min is contending with. She's trying to get Lily into a certain place, Lily and the protagonist in Seduction of the Minotaur. And it's so beautiful to read how it is that she's she's kind of you know coping with that or dealing with it or struggling or grappling um so you you get a real sense of her writing process in her diaries absolutely yeah. okay the next question um is from sarah who's sharing a little bit with us about her graduate school experience in the 70s so she said that the diaries of nin and doris lessing were her constant companions um helping right. her build a foundation of who she is today um, and she wondered if you could say more about Nin's legacy on young women in particular. Yeah, I, it's so, um, it's so exciting for me to hear young women reading Nin, definitely. I mean, my students come alive when I teach Nin in my, in my lit courses. Um, I think Nin really speaks to that, that, that sense of, um, again, the fight to, to really individuate and to find her voice in society. And that is such an archetypal thing. And again, I think that, that the waistline of men's times are very much what young women are going through today. I mean, we have so much at stake right now in terms of women's rights. And I think that men is a prominent voice. Um, and I've seen it. I've seen it with my students. I've seen it with my baristas who, who every time, you know, they, they, you know, and they know I've written about Nan. Um, they have all their tales to tell me about reading Nan. And it's always, it, it doesn't surprise me. It just really elates me that I think that, that Nan is being read by a new generation of, of young women. So I think Nan has a lot to offer um, women of all generations, largely. Absolutely. Uh, we have another question from another Sarah who is wondering if you can tell us which contemporary writers um, Nin admired and who brought, uh, who among the contemporary writers was bringing influence to her writing? Oh, gosh. Well, contemporary to her, of course, right? Um, I know yes. Dejuna Barnes. Dejuna yeah. Barnes, she admired Dejuna Barnes so much. Um, and um, she definitely admired Wolf's work. I mean, I'm thinking in her diaries in terms of who she would have mentioned, right? Um, she also met, um, um, admired some of the, the female psychologists at the time who were trying to, to kind of do some important works. Um, I'm trying to think of what other um, prominent contemporary writers of her time, and, and it's kind of some names are escaping me, sadly. Um, but one of the, the connections that I've um, been reading about um, in something else I'm working on right now is her, her draw to Tijuna Barnes and that connection that she, um, you know, um, had. And I think, you know, for me, it raises the question of, of feminine solidarity at the time and how the women did support each other and to what extent. Um, Nin, didn't, Nin had more of a male literary circle that she, that she engaged with at the time. It wasn't, um, the women, I mean, these are, this is such a rich conversation because, um, you know, the women, the, the, the modernist women, um, there were so many issues, women trying to, to make their way in, as writers and, and how did they support themselves uh, or each other, I mean. Um, and so it, it does become a question for me in terms of feminine solidarity. But I think, I think um, for Nin, it was so much more of the male circle. Um, not so much, I mean, they definitely were influencing her. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it's, um, there, there are many, and I'm so sorry that I can't think of more. I think you've given us a, a great place to start. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, the next question is from Christine, and she's commenting that Nin reminds her of Simone de Beauvoir um, in terms of the search for uh, accomplishment, anti-conformism, bisexuality, and is wondering if you, you know, if you also see those parallels and might comment on that. Yeah, definitely. Yes, absolutely. I, I often, you know, have these little fantasies where what would happen if we got these women together, right? What kinds of conversations would ensue? Um, so yes, I think I think there would be some parallels. Um, both of them writing in Paris too, especially right. Um, 
fighting against the same, you know, androcentric ideologies of the time. Absolutely. I think in, in some ways, Simone de Beauvoir would have paved the way um, for Nin to later come along. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we had another question along the same lines um, from Haley. So I hope that you've answered both of those. Um, we also have a couple of questions about your own writing practice. So I'll try to sort of lump those into one question. Um, so Sandra is wondering if Nin inspired you to keep a diary of your own. And <coughs> if so, um, did reading her diaries change your approach to your own? And then there was another one about, um, ah, so your writing practices while you were working on your book, um, how did it evolve and how did it compare to Nin's? <laughs> yeah, wow, those are really um, big meaty questions. <laughs> um, as far as Nin's inspiration on me as, as a diarist, I think I would definitely call myself a diarist. Um, it's an incredibly, you know, fluid and, and exciting form that, that I am drawn to. Um, I think um, for me that the writing that I do in, in the diary is very much a, a way of um, processing and, and kind of discovery for me. Writing in general is such a discovery, right? I don't always know where I'm gonna set, where I'm going um, until I start writing about it. Um, Nin's poetics um, kind of always blow me away and they still do. Um, I felt like every time I read, you know, one of Nin's diaries, that the, the inspiration is you always get this sense of, of a, even it's a, a diary entry, you get a sense that she's been, you know, somewhere in the underworld. She's eaten, you know, the pomegranate seeds and she comes back to the, to the page to, to record this profound experience. Um, mine are not like that <laughs> entirely. Um, and so, yes, Nin has inspired me, no doubt. Um, and as far as the process in writing the book and how would it parallel to men, gosh, I mean, I'm sure there is some, you know, parallel underworld experiences, um, you know, as, as writers um, in terms of the, the grappling and the difficulty. And then in terms of writing the book, I think it just depended on which chapter. There were some chapters that were way more difficult to write, um, right? Like the chapter, for example, chapter four that looks at the, um, Incest Diaries, the posthumous works. That was a, a very much, that was a deeply intense chapter to write. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, the, the process, I think every writer has their, right, their process in terms of what, what they dwell on. And, um, but overall, I think um, I'm deeply grateful that I, that I did it and that I stayed um, in it. And the book was definitely something that was, um, you know, took uh, some years to write. Um, it took years to gestate and then years to write. Um, but yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so I see two yeah. more questions here that I think we will have time for, but we will have to wrap up after that. Um, the first one is from Deborah, it was, came in earlier. Um, so you mentioned at some point the surrealist basically, so that may be the way in here, but She's wondering about, uh, you know, this, this idea of the trickster, trick star, that that sounds like the Dada is to her. So was she involved in that? Oh, movement at all? Interesting. Um, well, Nin was definitely, you know, she was definitely influenced and inspired and involved in surrealism. There's no doubt. I mean, she was reading Artaud, Rimbaud, um, um, Breton. Um, that's interesting. I, I don't. I don't. I hadn't thought about the connection between um, Dadaism and, and the trick star. Um, and I think the trick star, just to just to kind of get back to the trick star. Um, I think it is. Um, I, I don't think I mentioned this, but it, um, I think the trick star is an important figure to think about with Nin because the trick star has the same qualities as the trickster, right? Um, but we move around in body, so the trick star really allows us to see. Well, what is it like for um, you know, the, 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 fem the female body to move around in the world in this, uh, in this kind of topsy-turvy world. Um, so I'm not sure what kinds of connections there, there would be. So it's, a, it's an excellent question. Thank you for that. Yeah, and maybe to wrap up here, then I'll go ahead and get to Carrie's question. So she's writing, for women struggling with the same cultural ideology against which Nin was constantly pushing uh, cultural sexism, 
can you offer a thought from Nin which can serve as a daily mantra or reminder of how to resist it? I thought that was such a powerful question as we as we wrap up here. What what can you leave us with in terms of inspiration from Nin? Yeah. I think Nin wanted us to be deep sea divers. I do. I think um, we are at a point where we can all use some some pearls of wisdom from, from the deep sea dive. And so I think that that reminder of the justification, if we need one, for why the building of an interior world was so important to address calamities in society, it's, it's really to resist um, alienation from ourselves and others. So I think this this reminder of, of you know being with ourselves with our thoughts and, and sharing you know this intimacy with our sense of self um, and being willing to share that with others um, through our writing through our conversations I think is, is really pivotal right now as, as it is always in society so I hope that helps but yeah deep sea diving remember that <laughs> Thank you. A wonderful, wonderful thing to end on. Wonderful imagery as well. Yeah. So thank you again so much, Clara, for joining us for this conversation Absolutely. tonight. It's been wonderful thank to, you. to speak with you and host you, even if this couldn't be in person in Paris. We hope yeah. to meet you when you do get to travel and visit us sometime. So I thank know, you and I'm here. sad. I'm sad we won't be going to Au Petit Suisse in the Latin quarters after this. <laughs> right there has to be there has to be a future in which that happens we have to believe so we'll just we'll just be patient and keep reading in in the meantime um that's right also, in the meantime <laughs> i also wanted to thank our audience for being here tonight it's been wonderful to to take a look at your questions and your curiosity here um i should mention also that uh so the american library in paris is a nonprofit, as i said in my opening remarks and i did send out a link in my email with the zoom link um uh, as well to donate if you'd like. So we do accept donations where normally when we host events in person, we sort of ask for about 10 euros or something with, like this, whatever you're able to give on a completely voluntary basis. So if you're interested in supporting us in our centennial year, we'd be very, very glad to, to have your support. Um, also, I wanted to just highlight real quick, I've got my nice stack of upcoming and past evenings with an author guest. Um, so Kirsten Chen will be joining us next Wednesday, September 30. She's the author of Bury What We Cannot Take, which is a wonderful novel, and I'll be um, interviewing her about this book. So if that sounds like it might be of interest, it's, a, it's set in Maoist China, early Maoist China. Uh, it's the story of a family sort of torn apart and then maybe finding themselves back together. I can't give any spoilers, but it's a really, really fantastic read. And there's an opportunity to sign up for the event uh, on our homepage, just like where you found this one. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And thank you again to Clara. Great. Thank you again. Thank you. Great for everybody that could make it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, Catherine. Thank you.